Filming today for the Hamilton College Jazz Archive. I'm very pleased to have Dave McKenna here, who has been called a giant of the piano. Please. Greatest <laughs> left hand in the of the piano world. Yeah. All that. Is it okay to call you a giant of the piano? No, I mean, I don't. That's not true. Well, you're pretty tall, I, though. <laughs> yeah, but there are bigger piano players, too. Remember Stan Kenton? For, how about uh, Randy Weston? <laughs> He is bigger than you, okay. Did you, hear, did you hear about like a Randy Weston and some other tall piano player came in and happened to be standing next to Will Chamberlain and that reduced everything. <laughs> <laughs> He's tall, but there are taller folks than that. Yeah, I don't know if Will could even fit under a piano. <laughs> <laughs> well, nonetheless, you've, you've gotten some uh, pretty high accolades over the years and uh, it's a pleasure to talk to you. I've... Um, been looking at, you know, listening to some of your recordings and reading about you. And, you know, first of all, I'm interested. You, you've lived through some significant historical periods in America. Well, I don't know. Musically, uh, you're talking about changes in music, I suppose. Mostly. Actually, I was talking more about, I was curious if your parents uh, talked about the Depression for instance. No, you know, in that respect, we were lucky. When I was a little kid, we had good Christmases and all because my father worked for the post office. And in those days, that was a great job during the Depression, you know. The pay wasn't great, but it was steady. And, and uh, when a lot of folks were in real bad shape, we were in pretty good shape. Then the World War II came, and the postman's salary was meager then because factories started paying, you know, the, Mm -hmm. country made a comeback. And my mother, who was sort of a classical violinist uh, and a piano player, very good, but you know, she had good ears. She played nicely. Uh, she played the tunes of the day because she had a great ear, all the right chords. I wouldn't call her a jazz piano player, but she she went to work uh, playing in bar rooms and wherever, like weekends with little local bands, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, to make a little more money. So my mother and she was a very good classical violinist, though. That's what, that was her serious instrument, but she loved the tunes, the pop tunes, too. And I grew up hearing them. But that's d digressing a little bit. But um, So we weren't so poor from the time I was eight or nine years old until maybe I was 10 in 1940 when the war effort started. And then the country got more prosperous, and people were making pretty good money in the... Uh, in the mills and factories and stuff. Woonsocket is a textile town, you know. Uh -huh. Woonsocket, Rhode Island, where I'm from. And then the postman's salary was pr uh, not so good. Then years later, you know, there was a time in the 60s when things were going bad. I wanted to, I was thinking of taking the uh, civil service exam, becoming a postman because, and then uh, still money wasn't that, in the 70s it got good. Those guys are taken care of now. They, yeah. They're really, they really yeah. earn pretty good money and all their, the pension goes with it, and the government benefits, and all hospitalization. You know. That's talking about the post office. All <laughs> I of think it wouldn't be unprecedented, actually. But you know, my really father was a postal post driver, and I don't even drive a car. I'm one of the world's oldest non-drivers. No kidding. I never drove. Uh, you know, in my drinking days, it was a very fortunate thing for me, in particular, and humanity in general, that, uh, <laughs> that, that I didn't drive. But uh, <laughs> you didn't and have then a I developed a neurosis leave, about it, and. It's inconvenient living at the Cape. I, I sort of miss living in Boston, you know. I wish I were back there. Mm. You have to get a driver or something or yeah. someone to... Yeah, well, of course, on long gigs, the, the bus goes from the Cape to the airport in Boston, and people meet you at the airport. Like, you know, all the musicians were met in Buffalo. Right. Whether they drive or not, they're not driving here, you know. Right. <laughs> and when you go overseas, of course, that's even more yeah. the case. Was your family affected by World War II much? Well, I, I had a lot of uncles that were, were in the service and uh, on my mother's side. And uh, I don't think we were greatly affected by it, no. Mm -hmm. But you served in the Korean War, is yes. that right? Yes, I was drafted right from Woody's band, really, Woody Herman's mm -hmm. band, 1951. And I took basic down in... I, I forget what they call it, Camp Gordon, or Fort, Fort Gordon, outside of Augusta. And uh, that featured two things, like Signal Corps and MPs. There were a lot of, it was an MP. And I took basic with a bunch of guys slated to be MPs. And I took the eight weeks basic and then 
They said, I don't think McKenna's MP material. <laughs> they pulled me out. I was in a casual company doing KP every other day and loading trucks the other day. Yeah. So then they sent us overseas. And I figured, uh-oh, the infantry, you know. And they pulled a bunch of us out in Japan and sent us to cook school. And then uh, I went to Korea as a cook. Oh, so. no kidding. <laughs> but I didn't get to play the piano during that. Uh -huh. I, I was in, you know, until I think I went in September and got out in August, uh, you know, one one year and uh, 10, 11 months later. And right away, Boots Masuli called me, who I'd worked with just before. When I was 17 or so, I worked with Boots, a very good saxophone player. He's from Milford, Mass., which is right next to Woonsocket. And uh, he called me and worked with Boots around home, and then Charlie Ventura called again. Yeah. I was with Charlie just before joining Woody. I went mm -hmm. with Charlie when I was 19. And I was still 19 when I joined Woody. And you joined the Musician Union when you were about pretty 15, young, right? Yeah. About 15. And there were, there were guys on the road. Uh, you know, I heard Stan Getz left at home to go with Jack Teagon when he was 15. Uh -huh. So it took me till 19 to get on the road. <laughs> I, I was an old man. Did you come from a long line of drummers? Something yeah, like I remember exactly. Yeah. I really didn't. I don't know, my, my father and his father, and I guess his father before him. I don't know which one it was, but I found out later that one of them was a drummer boy in the Civil War, marched down south with whatever that Rhode Island regiment was. And I imagine, like, certain battles, the drummer, drummer boys like were right in there, you know, right out front. And stuff. Mm -hmm. I was sort of proud of them after yeah. I heard that. Yeah. But uh, I was the first in either four or three generations, at least, I think four, to not play the drums. Although I had a had a whack at them, the sisters in the parochial school I went to needed a drummer for their little walks. They yeah. figured, well, his father, he must be. I couldn't even roll on the damn thing, <laughs> so I was a bad drummer. Well, I think you inherited their sense of time anyway. Well, yeah. my father was a great military drummer. He could do a roll with a knife and fork on the table, okay. the, even as roll you ever heard, you know? <laughs> wow. I love to listen to snare drum solos to this day, uh -huh. you know? I worked with a lot of drummers, you know, I worked with Gene Cooper, and mm -hmm. Gene played marvelous solos, and I worked with Buddy Rich, and what he played was unbelievable, you know. It was a long time, I was in my late 20s or mid, mid to late, before I heard Buddy in person. I'd, I'd been working on him, but I never ran across him. I was with Charlie, went back with Charlie Ventura, working somewhere way on the south side of Chicago, and I took a train or, you know, something, and just couldn't find anybody who wanted to go, and heard Buddy sat in a preview lounge and listened to Buddy, and. Wow. Was this a <laughs> drum small, solo? Knock me out. Small group? Yeah, context. Buddy. Buddy, uh, uh, small group then. And then later on, I did work with Buddy briefly with a small group. Oh, I, I remember. I recorded that. with that band. Yeah. I have a picture of that. Yeah. Um, Mike Maneri, Selden yeah. Powell. I'm trying to remember the name of the album because I remember seeing you in that picture now. Yeah. Yep. Did you, do you like the big band context as a piano player? Well, I was a kid when I was with Woody. Uh -huh. And that's the only real big band I worked with for any length of time. I had a brief stint later on. My pal Dick Johnson was a buddy Morrow. I did a few gigs with him. I liked hearing a big band. There's nothing too much for a piano player to do. I think I like small band the best. Mm -hmm. And that includes solo. I, I'm really getting sick of the solo scene. And, and uh, I went on a uh, sort of a tour. The, the early part of my summer was working mostly with Scott Hamilton. <clears throat> and. Uh, he sure sounded beautiful. And we had different rhythm sections, but they were all good. And we worked in St. Paul, Minnesota, and, and then we went to L.A., and we came back, and we did a couple of gigs back east. And we did a one-nighter in Toronto. The money was bad. Then we did, <laughs> then we did a, a, three days, a couple of days in Portland, and then a week in Seattle. Scott sounded great, and, and the rhythm section players were all fine. And, uh, I just really enjoyed it. it. Made me want to work with a little band again. But economically, I hope it's possible that I can do that. You know. Yeah, because you had spent just a few nights doing solo piano, haven't yeah. you? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm getting my fingers are getting weary, and uh, not that I'm going to be that much help to a small band. But if the guys are trying, I I love it working with a guitar too. Ah. Love Cal Collins playing. I love Grace Sargent's playing, and. Uh, I'd like to be in a four-man rhythm section with one, one or two horns, you know. That's yeah. what I'd like to sort of end up doing if I play it. The solo work you did in uh, what it was two different clubs you were at for 
quite a number of years, right, in the Boston area? Well, yeah, one was at home at, at the Cape. I had a lot of years at the Collins, but only one winter really open, so I had to go different places at, in the cold of winter, the real deep winter. And I spent the summers there. Then I went to the Copley Plaza in Boston. That was my longest gig, about nine years. And I left there in June and went to the Cape and also on the road sometimes for the summer. And then went back in the fall. That was my longest gig. And it was a boring gig musically, but I really, the comfort level was <laughs> so high. I stayed in the hotel. I commuted in the elevator. <laughs> And uh, like I said, it was boring, but it was comfortable. And I could walk around Boston, Boston, or take a cab or take the subway. Mm -hmm. I could walk to Fenway Park, and I did a few times. And I could walk to Boston Garden, and a few times I was lucky enough to get a ticket to see the Celtics when the Celtics were good. You yeah. Know, they, and now uh, it was good living up there. Yeah. I miss I miss Boston. But the Cape is different. It's an hour and a half away, you know. What were the hours of a typical that typical gig? Nine to one Nine in those days. Yeah. Yeah. And you were pretty much up to your own devices as far as what you wanted to play. Yeah. I ended up playing really cocktail music there, but, which I like, you know. I just play tunes. Yeah. And uh, that's what I'll probably end up doing, even though I'm getting kind of weary of it. I mean, I don't seem to... I haven't had that busy a summer except for the gigs with Scott. I didn't work at the Cape at all except for mm -hmm. a couple of concerts. One in the church that I do every year. And uh, I think we work with Scott at this club on the Cape, too, one night. So that was fun. A couple of, I think I only worked two or three nights on the Cape this whole mm -hmm. summer. Once with Frank Tate and Howard Alden in a Woods Hole near Falmouth Community Center. That was fun, too. And uh, so the, I, I was mostly on the road this summer. Well, let me go back for a minute to, uh, you know, when. You were learning piano, and what attracted you to the kind of music that you eventually ended up playing? Well, I always liked songs, the songs I heard on the radio. I think my mother told me that I went to the piano and picked out a jingle I heard on the radio, you know. Uh -huh. and, uh, and I used to, I didn't like it when she practiced the violin. I didn't like, had an antipathy toward classical music, I guess, but. When she played the piano, she played tunes like Smoke Gets In Your Eyes and Stormy Weather. She played them very nicely, all the right chords. And I said, hey, I like those. And I, saw, I think I started playing those when I was eight or nine. I'm mm -hmm. not sure. Nine or ten, anyway. But I used to listen to the radio and hear a song. And most of it, I could pick it out. And uh, it went from there. I, for, for a brief time, I liked cowboy music, you know. Like, <laughs> Gene Autry and whoever was, uh, I like that. And then I heard Harry James' band. I was knocked out by that. Then Benny Goodman. And that's the lasting impression, you know. Yeah. And then Count Basie and the guys. and uh, Hey, Duke Ellington, I liked it all. And I didn't have a, a record player in the early days. And I used to, there was a station in, from Boston called the 920 Club. A, a band had come on every 15 minutes. What, a lot of the sweet Mickey bands, Sammy Kay, Guy Lombardo, Jan Garber to come on. I'd switch and try to find a swing van, you know? It's just like today. But I really know. started out just liking songs. And now I like, uh, it's gone back to that. I really, I'm more of a song player than a jazz player. I love the, the tunes from, uh, corny tunes even, from barroom songs. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I like them all, you know? Not only the beautiful ballads, yeah. but the, the guy that impressed me, and I didn't think, I didn't think I would get to like him so much. In the days when I worked at Condon's with Yank Lawson and Peanuts Hucko and, and well, Bob Wilbur took Peanuts place and Yank became the lead. We did an album with Clancy. We did a couple of albums. Clancy was the leader on one and Yank was the leader on the other. And we went out to Jersey in this car and Clancy's looking at me. He's quite a bit older, you know. Man of a thousand songs. I go, he's a banjo player. And I say, he's probably saying, oh God, it's young bebopper or whatever uh -huh. he thought of me. And, I'm looking at him saying, oh, I'm this banjo picking <laughs> son of a gun. And all I'd known of Clancy saying was a hug and a chalk, and I didn't like that tune very much. But when he started singing, he sang in a tenor voice, which I usually don't like. But he swung so much the way he did it. And some of these old songs, he made them just so happy. It was, it was great. I really enjoyed it. And I got to 
I think I got to do a couple of times. I was at a party out in the Rockies at Foothills outside of Denver. There was no piano. Clancy was there, and he entertained for a couple of hours, just picking on that banjo and singing. It was great. Uh -huh. There was no other word for it. It was great. You know? uh -huh. So I really liked those tunes. Then afterwards, a, f a friend of mine gave me tapes of Clancy with that Earth, uh, San Francisco, Lou Waters, and Yerba Buena. All these old songs like uh, At the Devil's Ball, like the Irving Berlin tunes from before 1920, and Peoria, songs like that, yeah. and uh, uh, Sailing Down Chesapeake Bay. I love those old barroom songs. And it's a... Uh, I don't like some of the old sawdust on the floor, like banjo playing disc, disc, man. but it's Clancy had an mm -hmm. aura of truth about him, uh -huh. you know. I, that was good music. It really was. There's a, and so I still have a fondness for the, you know, the Condon years. And the, Bobby Hackett used to call that music Whiskey Land. Uh -huh. And I love that music. I love those guys. Cuddy and later Lou McGarrity and, and Peanuts and Bob Wilbur. Of course, they're swing players of it. But it sort of been, it, it goes together. At first, we had Buck Clayton when I was at Connors, and then uh, Yank Lawson. I loved them both. And the first time I worked was not with the Eddie band, was with Bobby Hack. I had a long association with Bobby Hack. So that's, uh, Bobby taught me a lot of tunes, too. Mm -hmm. Was Eddie Condon uh, as much of a character yeah, he was. As, as the books take <laughs> yeah, out? He was sort of subdued, the years, but he was still a funny man. Yeah. Very. And he played. He only came up to play a few times. He usually he'd sit and talk with the people, but he played good rhythm and all the right chords. I, I hear he only took one solo in his, in his life on record. It was a record with Fats Waller. Yeah. Somebody told me that. I don't well, know if that's true. Did he just play a four-string guitar or something? Or was it? Uh, wasn't the? Wasn't it the? A ukulele. A five-string. I don't know what I don't, it was. I don't remember. But. I'm not an expert on the guitar. Yeah. I know who I like though. Right. We got a couple of good ones here. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, the year when you went to, uh, you recorded for a lot of labels. Yeah, I did. The first, the first record I made was that first trip with the Charlie Ventura. That was an RCA Victor recording group. And the personnel, was, uh, Boots went back with him. So the Boots was really played baritone with the man. And it was Charlie, Boots, Benny Green on trombone, a wonderful trombone player, Conti Candoli on trumpet. Conti was going with Betty Bennett at the time. She later married Andre Previn, a wonderful singer Betty was, too. Mm -hmm. You see, Roy and Jackie, Roy, Jackie Kane and Roy Crawl had left. And then they got another piano player <clears throat> for a few months, and then they called me. Boots asked me if I wanted to. And Red Mitchell was the bass player. Ed Shaughnessy was the drummer. And at home, I very seldom worked with bass because they were three-piece bands, generally saxophone, piano, and drums. I'd work with a few bass players, but they were only semi-pros. Now I'm on my first real professional band on the road, and there's Red Mitchell, this giant of a bass player. I said, wow, this is what real bass players are like. Uh -huh. Well, they're not all like that, you know, but wow, it, it was something else. And then um, Red left, the, Woody Herman uh, broke up the second herd, what they called it, and started a, a little small band with uh, Bill Harris and Milt Jackson. Red went to join that, and they went to Cuba to do that. Then Woody worked a couple of other places with that band, and uh, a few months later, he organized another big band. Was, they were going to call it the Third Herd, but they never did. Uh -huh. they, they were trying to emphasize more dance music. Oh. But it wasn't for Red. Red went, stayed with the band and asked me if I wanted to audition. So I was with Woody for a year and a half. And we had some good players on that band, but there were great trumpet players. We had good saxophone players. It was Bob Graff from St. Louis and uh, Marty Flax on baritone. Buddy Wise, who came off Gene Krupa's band, and uh, Sam Merrillis was with the band at Bob City when it opened, but he didn't stay. It became a three tenor, tenor and baritone band. Mm -hmm. Marty left, Sam Staff came on, and Phil Urso came on. But the trumpet players were Conti and Rolf Erickson, and Neil Hefty even was back, and Bernie Previn at Bob City. Then the, those guys left. Don Ferrara, Lenny Tristano type thing. So, Conti and Don stayed in Rolf, and then Doug Metamy joined the band. Later on, Conti left, and Nick Travis came on, and Don Fager quit. We had great trumpet players, but there wasn't much for them to play. All uh -huh. the jazz went to the tenors, you know. Yeah. And Red was the bass player, then Sonny Igo on drums. And uh, that was a good experience, and I enjoyed it very much. When you we were talked about first playing with Red Mitchell, and like, wow, this is what bass is really like, was it hard for you to stop 
Oh, no, no, so I, didn't, I didn't do here. any of that. I didn't do any of that at all. Oh. I wasn't even into that that much then, anyway. Uh-huh. I mean, uh, there was a suggestion when I'd play at home, I'd put in a few, but I didn't really. That came later when, when I was home between bands and say, well, something's missing when I play a tune. I'd like to hear it, but so I just started easing into that. I didn't do it consciously to develop a solo style uh -huh. at all. Didn't do it that way. But when I was home and playing, in order to hear, I'd play like a single line, you know, in the right hand I'd play like, that was what I was into when I was, they'd try to play like a horn player and just play a bass line here, very few chords. It wasn't very pianistic. Hmm. So later on, I got a little more pianistic. Even on my first solo album, that was mostly what it was, a bass line and playing the, uh, you know, playing the melody first and then improvising on the melody a little bit. It's some chords, of course, on the ballads. But I didn't, I tried to get a little pianistic later on, but it was, some of it was forced, to tell you the truth. And, uh, I don't know what, what I involved at. I'm st I think I'm trying to de-emphasize that bass line now. Yeah. De-emphasize it. I like the, the sort of strumming style. It's not stride. It's sort of just playing like a guitar player. Mm -hmm. You still got a bass line, but yeah. you stay on one note more and play chords. I think that's what I prefer to do nowadays. Right. That's got to be, is it fairly strenuous work? Did I you, think so. Ever have... I never thought so before, but my hands are getting tired and yeah. old. and getting uh, diabetic neuropathy problems and tendonitis in this hand maybe and, mm -hmm. and just general slowing up. And <laughs> well, maybe it would be good to play in a, in a band where you don't have to carry yeah, the whole thing. Right, you know? right. Man. Well, when you went with um, Concord Records, that's been a pretty good label for you. Hasn't yeah, it? it's been a long association. I think it started in 1978 or so. Before that, um, I, I said that first record was with Charlie Ventura, and I had a, even had a, maybe an eight-bar solo on one of those sides. It, it wasn't an album or anything. And then with Woody recorded, and I think it was for maybe Capitol at first, and then MGM, made some s few records with him. And then uh, I didn't record, recorded with Charlie Ventura when I got out. And my first solo album came about, I think Don Costa was interested in me anyway, but. I played an Irby Green for an ABC Paramount record, and mm -hmm. the rhythm section had to leave, and so Irby asked me to do a couple of tunes, maybe one with him and two solos, something like that. But shortly after, I did my first solo album for ABC Paramount. And I got some bad advice, I think, because good guys, uh, but they, they were up in another category, arranging type people, and I think it was Marion Evans, my great friend, a brilliant arranger, that said, don't sign with anybody. But it, the way I was, I was so irresponsible. It was always, I wasn't married and I didn't, didn't I figured it'd always be gigs for, I didn't know the music business was gonna change so radically. So I didn't sign any contract and uh, the critics received that first album very well, but I didn't record again for about three years. I did that, an album for Epic called, uh, know, that dumb name, Piano Scene of Dave McKenna. They didn't name it, I, I didn't name it, they did. Yeah. <laughs> but that was an, I think maybe, sometimes I think maybe that's the best album I ever did. It was just a jam session. I had O.C. Johnson, a great drummer. John Drew, the bass player that was with me when I was with Gene Krupa. Both those guys died early. They were dead about five years later, I think. Young, young men, too. And uh, after that, I don't think I recorded until, well, maybe in 19, I did an album for a real fly-by-night company called Lullabies and Jazz. Then it was years before I recorded. Mm -hmm. It was around in the 70s sometime. When I, w I did record again, it was two albums in one day, one for Hank O'Neill and one for Mary McPartland's label. And then I did a mess of them for Chiaroscuro, you know, solo. Yeah. And uh, <coughs> one was Zoot. <coughs> I can't remember what else I did for them. And one for Harry Lim's label with ha Al Cohn, I think. And how's the, uh, how's the recording been for you as far as, uh, do they pay you a flat fee to do that? They, those, those people did. Uh, I never sold enough at ABC. And, uh, remember, those were like major labels, ABC and Epic, my first two albums. And then the others were like more or less downhill because they were little jazz labels, mm -hmm. not counting the one that was complete obscure thing, lullabies, that was Realm Records or somebody. Then I did one for a, a Friends in Boston recorded at Jordan Hall. My good friend Ron Delacase was a disc jockey up there. 
they, uh, that was another obscure one. I don't think that ever got outside of Boston much. And then came those uh, chiaroscuro years. So Concord was, I think they had better distrib distribution than mm -hmm. chiaroscuro and all that. Concord got to be sort of a, a small major label, you know. And Concord, I have a royalty agreement, and it wasn't much at first, but uh, hey, it got quite a bit better. It got okay. A little. I'm not making any fortune by any means, but now there's trouble, and I didn't get any money this summer, and I don't know, since Carl died, there's a whole different management. Oh. And so that's a whole different business story, and uh, yeah. I don't know what's happening. I don't think I have much longer to go. So if anybody wants to call me and, <laughs> and uh, talk about making a record, I'd probably be available. All you record label owners out there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I like some of the, um, your album titles, too, are, are creative. You know, kind of, you had a no bass hit. I think that was, I gotta give Carl Jefferson credit. I think he yeah. just came up with that in Major League. Yeah. Those were the two with the, uh, No Bass Hit was the first one with Concord. That was with Jake and Scott. Mm -hmm. And then I did a solo album shortly after, I think. And then Major League was a few years later. And for Concord, I did a, you know, a trio album playing at Harry Warren music. And I did an album with Gray Sargent duo, and uh -huh. an album with Joe Temperley duo, an album with Buddy DeFranco duo, a lot of duos. And uh, plus the things I did as a sideman with. Uh, with uh, Cal Collins and Scott and Warren Vachey and those things in Japan and so mm -hmm. forth. So I did have a, uh, that was my longest record association, yes. You mentioned uh, th there was a time in your life when you were thinking about the post office. Yeah, well, you know, is, in is the there, 60s. Is, okay, that's what I was gonna say, uh, a stretch of years that, that music has been the toughest for you. That was it. I was living in New York and I woke up and I was working at Eddie Condon's. I think the base pay was 150 a week and they took $25 out of the income. And I think my rent in that walk up was about 130 something. And I had a little kid, a little baby boy, Steve. Wow. And uh, it was, I got a few extras, but you see the guys that work Condon's, like Yank and all those guys, some of them were on staff and they did this to play music, but they had a salary, so oh. I wasn't a staff. Although Bobby Hackett did me, get me a little while subbing at ABC. That was, that was good. Yeah, that was nice. And in those years, I'd go out with Hackett some, too. You know, little concerts here and there. I had a long association with Bobby. First was in 1958, and then I left. I'd leave and come back and leave, come back. Yeah, that, that sounds like a be pretty tight to live in New York on that kind yeah. of base pay, I guess. We moved in 1966. I think I did better right away. Because somebody said to me, look, you travel a lot anyway to make a living. and You can get a plane or bus from the Cape and go to where you're going. And, and the kids will grow up with fresh air, which happened. That really happened. You know, mm -hmm. It's good for them. Now, um, um, uh, I never really dug New York that much. I never considered myself a New Yorker. But I do like Boston. And, I miss Boston a lot, <laughs> living in the city from those Copley years, you know. Uh -huh. Officially, I was living at the Cape, but most of the, most of the year I was in Boston, staying at the hotel. Well, m maybe the Celtics will come back, you know. <laughs> they have a good coach now. Well, Let's see what it is. <laughs> those, those were the glory days. So, Mark, are you, do, uh, do you pl are you doing some playing yourself like that? Yeah, I'm a saxophone and tinkle you piano. Yeah, I understood that, but... What style do you favor? Do you like to play in a small group, a big group? Well, band? it's interesting because uh, I went through my kind of contemporary jazz uh, period where I was listening to, like, Weather Report and all that. Yeah. But I'm Playing like Wayne a, Shorter, maybe. Yeah, like, huh? but I've always been a huge Cannonball Adderley fan. Oh, yeah. He just, for me, he was it, and still is, basically. But now my tastes are really ranging backwards into the kind of stuff that we'll be hearing tonight. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it, a lot of it's from, from doing these interviews and talking to... Do you play clarinet too? Not really. Oh. I, I was one of those people that started on clarinet but didn't stay with it very long and it's but hard do you, to go Do you back. play tenor and some Mostly alto? soprano and alto. But you're... Uh, yeah, oh, that's sure. Yeah. So, so that's a cannonball freak, yeah. Yeah. Or he was something else. Right? Yeah, I got to see him a few times. What about I, that group with Miles with the... Wasn't it Cold Train and Cannonball? Cold Train and Cannonball. Milestones, they recorded that. 
Man. Uh, wait, is that something else, huh? Yeah. And uh, I went remember? back myself, of course. I, I, you could say, regressed or something. When you think that, you know, Bill Evans and I had about the same, it would be the same age, and I knew mm -hmm. Bill Casley for years, and he went on to pioneer a new piano style, and I guess we weren't that far apart in the uh, middle 50s, you know. And then I w went and played with the, uh, started with Bobby, and I realized how much I liked that music. And then hearing the Eddie Conner guys and working on it, I got to be a whiskey land player uh -huh. in a barroom band. Bill went on to, I sort of lost track of him for many years because his playing got so complex. I knew how brilliant it was, but I didn't listen. Then I heard him, uh, oh man, he sounded so beautifully. I played opposite him in Boston, and I played the intermission at a club called Lulu's. And then about a year later, uh, one of those mini jazz festivals in Seattle. It was the Concord Band with the Scott and Cal and Warren Vache and I don't know if Mike was playing bass. I forget. No, I think it was Bob Mays playing bass then. And the L.A. Four with Ray Brown and uh, Lorindo Amita and Jeff Hamilton and Bud Shank, Bud Shank. and Bill's trio with uh, Joe uh, LaBarbera and the Mark Johnson said, man, God, it sounded so, it sounded like a symphony orchestra. Uh -huh. It was so magnificent. It was great. He even used the um, Fender Rhodes on a couple records. I don't know if you ever heard it. Did you ever have to play on one of those electrics? Oh, yeah. yeah. Sure, I played the Fender Rhodes in a band. Yeah, when I first went to the Cape, um, we had a, Dick Johnson, Luke Colombo had a, like a six-piece band, and, and they wanted a little rock music, cause, so the rock that, Jazz type guys can do. <laughs> no. The drum was so loud. I had to get it. They had to get me a, a Fender Rhodes or the other one. And I think I tried two kinds. I even have an electric piano at home now, a Korg. Yeah. Well, oh, they've come a long way. Yeah. But but I have to jump on something you said because I want you to explain it. You said the kind of rock that jazz guys can play. Well, you know, we didn't know that many of the tunes. Yeah. But we. Uh, there was the pop tunes had a rock influence. Certain tunes of Burt Bacharach, The Look of Love and all that, we had to play that. And we'd play Sonny and we'd play some blues. And I guess we played, what was the one that they all did a, a drum solo on every time? Oh, Wipeout? Yeah, yeah, things <laughs> like that. Obvious rock tune. And, and uh, whatever those tunes of the day were, we, everybody played loud, so they had to get me. They couldn't hear the piano and just get me electric piano. I enjoyed it a little bit. And we, we played it on, the, on some of the jazz tunes we played, too. I had to, I recorded on it, mm -hmm. you know. That was another local record at a restaurant. It was a good band, too. Dick Johnson's a fine reed player, you know. He's a, the Artie Shaw, he leads the Artie Shaw band now. Oh. And he's, he's made records for Riverside when, uh... Well, you're such a d detective of tunes. And you like, there's some current pop writers that occasionally attract you, isn't there? Oh, yeah. Michael Franks. Uh, oh, yeah, I dug his tunes. But it's funny words, too. Not that I can sing. I yeah. have no words, but it's great. But he has a strong um, Brazilian influence, too. And that's really my favorite music today. It's funny, though. I don't play it. But everybody likes Jobim and Gilberto, you know. And then I heard some, some of the others. I liked it. The Tom Before, they knocked me out. Um, then later, Milton Nascimento. Mm -hmm. I didn't like it when he sang falsetto and all, but when he's down in the ring, he's a beautiful singer. He's got yeah. the most beautiful voice of all those guys. Like Joe Beam didn't have any voice, but it was beautiful. Yeah. And now I love Yvonne Lenz, you know. Yvonne Lenz, you've heard of him? I have not heard of him. Oh, he's got a rough out. voice, but he's brilliant, man. And then there's, uh, I don't know how you say it. Well, I like the girl singers. Elise Regina, the one that, she was, a, Big pop singer like the Barbara Streisand of uh, uh -huh. Brazil. She died, they say, of an overdose. But Joe Beam said on a record thing, this girl never took dope or, or uh -huh. even had a drink. She smoked a lot. That was uh -huh. that's suspicious there. And Gal Costa, she's a, a big pop star. And now, um, oh, and Dori Kaimi, I think your name. He's from an old, beautiful, beautiful music. Mm -hmm. But now there's new guys, I don't even know who they are. You know, the, the, did you hear Toots Thielman's Brazil project? Yeah, nice record, huh? Oh, man, all those guys are big singers in Brazil, uh -huh. you know? And uh, I love that music. Yeah, well, the world's getting smaller, I think. Oh, yeah, it's, it's, but on the other hand, then I go back and say, well, what, are, what do you really like? And it's that, 
or go way back and hear Louis Armstrong singing and playing. You know, not necessarily with the, not those nineteen uh, twenties things, but the middle ones, the thirties when he's um, with the greatest strutting with some barbecue of all and. Thanks a million and uh, even tie and swing that music. Ooh, what was he playing and singing? You know, uh -huh. even that, and that record he did with Oscar later, singing those old standards. Mm -hmm. You ever heard that? Wow, Oscar and Herb Ellis and Ray Brown, and Ed Thigpen, I guess. That's tough. And I think most of it comes from Louis, American jazz. Well, mm -hmm. at all, yeah, the jazz singing does. And I like the blues singers too. I like them all. I like my kids' records. I, I like Van Morrison a little bit. I even like certain tunes of Paul Simons. I always liked James Taylor. And my oldest kid liked the Stones. He loves jazz, too. And who else do I like? I like Eric Clapton very much. Uh -huh. I think he's a fine musician. You know? Yeah, I agree. And, uh, and as far as the old boy blues singers, I love Joe Turner, big Joe Turner. Mm -hmm. The record that you ever, uh, I wonder if you ever heard the record he made with Zoot and JJ and Lockjaw Davis no. and, ooh, Count Basie. <laughs> Yeah, oh. What was it about Basie that oh, just for, kept you know, him for years? You know, people you know? used to ask me in interviews for, and I always used to forget. I said, well, I like them all. And I'd mention, like, the old guys and the new guys. But I always sort of forget Count. And Bill Basie remains one of my favorites because uh, I said, well, come on. And, uh, hey, he made a few notes, but they're all from the cherry tree. They're the right <laughs> notes, you know? <laughs> He could stride away when he was younger, too. If he wanted to do that, he yeah. could do that. Yeah. The kid from Red Bank and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Kyle could play some piano. Wow. If you had to sit down and write a list of all the tunes that you have in your memory. Mm -mm. I'm not even a contender for the championship. No? No. Nope. Jimmy Rolls is gone now. He knew an awful lot of tunes. Tommy Flanagan knows a lot. Hank Jones. Those guys know. And I think Tommy. He knows more of the bebop tunes. I, I, uh, I sort of left, the, I only knew the real early bebop songs, and I don't know the charts later on. Tommy knows them, and he probably knows most of the tunes I know, and, and a few that I don't. He, Hank Jones would have to be Ellis Larkin, uh -huh. very elegant piano player. I love his playing. He knows the, uh, but I don't know how many yeah. tunes, but I don't know. <laughs> I, it'd be hard to uh, to actually count them, but when you get on these gigs at these jazz parties, um, how do you come to a consensus about what's going to be played? I don't take part in it. I really don't. I say, what do you want to play? I say, no, what do you want to play? Because I can't, I'm not good at thinking tunes. That's why when I started doing a lot of solo piano, I never knew. I'd make a little list on it. I'd say, well, I'd, it's funny, it'd be like a jazz band in the early, early bebop days. Somebody said, you want, what should we play? How about this? No, I don't want to play that. Let's play something else. Well, here I was a piano player of my own. And I had, there's a click. There's a, there's a me that made up the list. And I said, well, I don't want to play that. <laughs> so I started playing these medleys where, where word association comes, either of composers or like a word association. And that gives me a bunch of tunes to play. And I'm not stuck, you know, in uh -huh. between tunes. It doesn't matter when it's copyrighted, like at the Copley, there was a sort of buzz of conversation, not loud, but and nobody really, uh, the people that really wanted to hear me play said, Dave, we'd, we'd come once in a while to hear you play. That we've heard, uh, we'd like to hear you play in other circumstances where the piano was mic'd a little bit. Yeah. So most of them were like uh, intent listeners, and I just killed time. <laughs> At first, there was a piano part there, too, and I just talk with the customers and noodle, and yeah. that part was easy. Uh -huh. But when I have to play, uh, people are listening, I, I, I developed these medleys. And, it gets me going, and before you know it, I've killed half an hour or three quarters of an hour. <laughs> or an hour. <laughs> Did you ever get a request that you wouldn't play because it no, was... No, if I know it, I'd play it. Yeah. Even a, a terrible song. Yeah. But try to dismiss it quickly. Right. And play it through and play it one and a half choruses. But I'm embarrassed because there were some tunes that I'm prejudiced against that I never liked, and I should have learned. I had metal blocks about them. New York, New York. At, when I was at the Copley, that was big. And I said, well, if you really want to hear it, I got the music upstairs. And sometimes I said, well, why? Once they said, why don't you? I said, Jeez. I went upstairs in my room, got it, <laughs> muddled through it. And, well, as Ray Santisi, a fellow 
piano player from Boston called it Memories from Cats. <laughs> Memories was a terrible song. I hate to put anybody down over here, but I think Lloyd, uh, what is his, Weber? Andrew Lloyd Weber. Hey, Andrew Lloyd Weber. Is, he's knighted by the queen. <laughs> eh? And, and one, one classical conductor that compared him to Puccini, I think that's... Oh, dear. I think that's a scandal, an outrage. I don't I like know. his songs at all. It's kind of funny, because he gets to the end of the song, and he's, he, he's, he ended up in a different key than he started with, but he wanted to go back to where he started. And instead of doing something creative, like yeah. Irving Berlin might have something, he just, yeah. like, clunk. He just, yeah. like, put it right back there. And oh, well, that's, that's <laughs> excusable sometimes. Sometimes that's interesting, but, I mean... Even the Beatles, they wrote lovely, uh, nice little moments in their songs, but it's fragmentary. They're not put together like a Jerome Kern or Irving Berlin mm -hmm. song, you know. They make, they have a, f a form to them, a shape to them. It's great. I'm really, uh, uh, I guess, reverting to old fogeyhood, but I mean, the, you can't, you, uh, the new songs, most of them don't even compare, of course. Mm -hmm. but that was a golden age of uh, yeah. all those songwriters, you know. And jazz guys contributed some, you know. And you got to say that one guy stands out so much because he was at the, one of the greatest bands of all time, if not the greatest. I'm talking about Duke, of course. Mm -hmm. And, and a, a different type piano player. I love that. Uh, I don't play like him, but I think Thelonious Monk got his early, you know, his attack from Duke. And and being a songwriter of those beautiful things, he's the most versatile guy. He has to be way up there in the pantheon, you know. Yep. Louis Duke, Count Basie for his band, and Lester Young, and uh, all those. Uh, well, Ben Webster, and I'm partial to him, too. Yeah. And then Bird and Diz, and everybody. Right. And Charlie Christian, mm -hmm. one of the pioneers of. The what do you think about life. the state of jazz today? I don't know much about it. I, I just, uh, I hope that, you know, it was. There's young guys playing that uh, their version of the, the new jazz and fusion and stuff like that. And then there's the classicists like Winton and um, Fine. They, they're making people hear some of the old songs. And, uh, I, know, I know there's some brilliant players. I haven't got a chance to hear them all. But I know that, thank God, for people like Scott and, and uh, Grace Sargent, the young guitar player from... And guys like Cal Collins and still playing, you know, the mainstream kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean they can't be creative within that, you know. Anybody in but particular? Harry Allen, too. Harry? You heard him? Gee, he's so young, too. But he's playing great. I went to Frank Tate, the bass player, took a band in Ireland and England last November, and Harry knocked me out. I knew he could, I knew he played well, but he's far behind that now. Uh -huh. And then uh, I did a record date with him for a Japanese label in June in New York with Michael Moore and Jay Cannon, the four of us. And I really enjoyed that, too. Anybody in particular writing tunes today that you think Well, I love Johnny Mandel's tunes. I don't know oh. many of them. I yeah. love his songs. And uh, I'm sure there are other people. Can't think of who they are. My eyes are watering. I hope that doesn't show them. I'm no. having trouble with my eyes with diabetes. I got to see a new eye doctor next Tuesday. Uh -huh. I hope he's not going to say, well, he'll probably say new glasses. That's <laughs> expensive enough. Or, but I hope that I don't have to put that stuff in him every day. You know, yeah. I've got enough. Well. Do you stare at the keyboard when you play? No, sometimes I do. You yeah. know, sometimes I did it to keep from looking at the people. <laughs> because I did wasn't a smiler, and I knew I was. But, um, Sometimes I stare at the keyboard now because I say, hey, what am I doing here? And why did I play that lick and stuff, you know? And maybe I think if I look at the piano, it'll get me back. There were times when I did, like, look around the house and count I got very conscious of uh, business. And, you know, at the Copley, when I went there, started a business, was very good. And when I was there about eight or nine years, you could see business falling way off. It was... Partly because uh, I was there so long. Other reasons, too. But um, as you get older, you get conscious of those things. You say, hey, no people. You won't be invited back, you know. And I just did a thing at Tavern on the Green in New York. I got to tell you, in August, 
It was the worst business I have ever done in New York City. Okay. True, it was the week before Labor Day week, it was, and they didn't advertise very much. And some of my friends, like, they put the cover charge down. It was kind of an expensive place, but they did lower the cover. Business was terrible. I think I only had one good night in the five nights I played there, Tuesday or the six nights I played there. And I think the only good night was Wednesday or Thursday. It wasn't uh, Friday, maybe. Mm -hmm. It wasn't Saturday. And wow, that was panicky. I don't think, I don't think, even if they asked me, I don't think I want to go back there. No. I just can't, I just can't do business in that place. I, yeah. I was okay there before a couple of times, uh -huh. you know. But that's uh, a wake-up call, sort of, you know what I mean? It was terrible. A lot of uh, good piano players have played there. You're a pretty oh, yeah. good friend of Marion McPartland's. Oh, right? yeah. I think she's been there. And... Oh, a lot of people have been there. Tommy Flanagan. Dorothy Donegan does very well. Uh -huh. But I hear even, um, I don't know if how well she did the last time, but the guy told me that he, Irving, uh, I mean Irving, Illinois Jaquette's big band was always a big draw because naturally. And even they didn't do well this last time. So yeah. something must be shaken. It, they're, People don't want to go there. The food's too expensive or yeah. something. I don't know. Yeah. It's I a saw tourist it. joint anyway. I saw Illinois there. It's a pretty big place just for piano, it seems like. I never heard that. Yes, I did on a cruise when I heard that big band of Illinois. Mm -hmm. It's good, isn't it? Yeah. We saw you on a cruise. Maybe a it was that years one. Ago. Was no, it, it was, was different. It, it was in the Caribbean. Oh, yeah. And you were playing in the lounge there. Well, I'm so glad we got to talk here. Yeah. It's, it's been, been fascinating. I'd like to hear you but, play, Mug. Well, Let me we'll sit in what he says. <laughs> I don't know. I might get thrown out bodily. <laughs> but uh, I hope you have a good set tonight, and um, I hope that uh, you get home safely. Because, but you won't be driving, so it should no, be no. Uh, I have to go. I have next week off, except to see some doctors, mm -hmm. and then I go to San Francisco for three days. Strange. Mm -hmm. Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, I'm playing it. Ed Moose is out in uh, San Francisco. I love that town. Mm -hmm. Love it. Mm -hmm. But you can't get comfortable three days and then back home. Right. Yeah. Has the nightclub business spending, you know, so many nights in the, in the clubs and bars, has that been a uh, made for a hard life? Well, I used to love it. Of course, I used to drink, you know, but uh, I used to like nightclubs and bars. But as I get older, um, it's not that I dislike them myself, but, you know, audiences are, are familiar with our music. Those people are getting older. Some of them are gone now, a few of them, but the ones that aren't gone don't go out as much. They don't want to go to a place where they have a couple of drinks and then drive. They're conscious of it. The young people aren't. They go yeah. to a rock joint and, I mean, not so much. I don't say, I'm, some of them are responsible, right. of course. But, um, so, it's not a, maybe there should be another venue, like a, bring back tea dances at the hotels or something, right. you know, something like that. Maybe that'd work. Yeah, well, dancing was an awful big part of I, much I of like music. I grew up playing, like, swing music, and you played for dancing. I, I like playing for dancing. Yeah. A lot of jazz musicians don't. I do. It takes the pressure off. I was going to ask you, Mark, about where's uh, Hamilton? Is I don't think I've ever been there. But is Cortland near there, the Cortland Apples and all that? Or? Yeah, it's just an uh, hour and a half south of us. That's south. Yeah, big apple country. That's right. Yeah, good apples, too. Yeah. Yeah, it's a nice area, as you can see in our picture here. Yeah. Gorgeous. Nice time of the year. In the... Oh, yeah. In fact, it will be for a few weeks, right? That's the right. leaves and all. Probably, probably uh, until... The same, the same season as Vermont, New Hampshire. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks for sharing your time. No. It's been a great pleasure. My pleasure. So on behalf of Hamilton College, I'd like to thank Dave McKenna, and uh, we'll be listening tonight. Okay. Right.